afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining the Santa Rosa Fire Department and the Office of Community Engagement for such an important and timely series on being wildfire ready. My name is Magali Tellez, and I am the Director of Community Engagement for the City of Santa Rosa. Buenas tardes a todos y gracias por su presencia y participación en este evento tan importante sobre cómo estar preparado para los incendios forestales. Mi nombre es Magali Tellez y soy la directora de participación comunitaria de la ciudad de Santa Rosa. Si gustaría sintonarse en, el, en español, puede hacerlo haciendo clic en el icono del globo que dice uh, Interpretation en el fondo de la pantalla. ASL interpretation is also provided and the interpreter will be spotlit for the duration of this webinar. To our presenters, uh, please, we ask that you speak clearly and allow for our Spanish and ASL translation. Now, to get us started, I would like to introduce Fire Chief Scott Westro. Thank you. Thank you, Magali, and thank you for everyone who is joining us today. Um, thanks for taking your lunch hour with us and really appreciate everyone being here and being engaged at this level. Um, I know some of you may have been on for our presentation yesterday, and this may be a little bit redundant, but I wanted to take this opportunity to thank Director Tejas and her team for putting this together. Um, this was Magali's uh, brainchild, and this was her idea, and she's really been the driving force behind getting this off the ground, and, and we're happy to partner with the Office of Community Engagement in this endeavor. So a little bit about why we are doing this. Really, if you look at everything that's going on in the community um, and everything that has gone on in the community, the one bonding element has been the fires. And that bond has built really a, a sense of strength and resiliency um, throughout the community, but it also comes with the unfortunate trauma that goes along with it. So um, I feel that we've collectively shown as a community what resiliency looks like and how that strength actually unites us. So. Um, as, a, as been evidence over the last four years, um, we've shown that we're stronger together. Um, nobody's in this alone. Um, it's not the fire department being stronger. It's not the city or the city employees. Um, it's everybody, including those community members. So really appreciate everybody being here. Um, this is series is designed to essentially look at where we've been, uh, where we're going, uh, how to heal personally and as a community and how to be more prepared and control the elements of what we can control. When you look at what controls a wildfire or a vegetation fire, there's only certain elements that we can actually control and, and the number one area there is fuel. So that's one of the things we're focusing most on. Um, but every little thing that we can do, anybody, any member of the community can do to their home or to their property is gonna make us all stronger in the end. So that's really where this, this bond of strength comes from and, and the direction that we're going. Our second session today will discuss lessons learned from the 2017 Sonoma County wildfires and the 2020 glass fire, and how the city of Santa Rosa is assisting residents to ensure their homes and properties are wildfire ready. Topics covered in this session will include the wildland urban interface, funding for wildfire prevention, home hardening, defensible space, weed abatement, and more. The changes that we've seen in the response to wildland fires we've experienced over, over the last several years have been remarkable. But it's not just a fire department issue, it's not a public safety issue, it's not the city or the county effort alone. This is a whole community approach to changes that leads to improvement and resiliency. The changes are working, but they can be better. Just as a point of clarification, if we look at the Tubbs fire alone, not including the Nuns fire, the Tubbs fire within the city limits, we were very unfortunate to lose nine lives and over and right around 3,100 homes or structures. Move three years forward to the glass fire, we lost no lives, thankfully, and only 32 structures were destroyed. Our common goal is a net zero across the board, and that's what we're working towards to get to that, that common zero where we have no structures lost, no lives lost. Um, we may lose some property in the process because Mother Nature is going to win that battle every day, uh, but we need to get to that net zero, and it takes all of us to get there. I wanted to take a quick opportunity while I have some time to talk, to talk about some of the changes the fire department specifically has made in the last four years, just to give everybody some education and maybe some sense of calm and, and reassurance. Number one is early detection of fires. Um, we have an advanced uh, network of weather stations that we utilize on a daily basis, if not more, 
um, to track the weather as, as it's coming in and prepare our resources based off the weather. And then we also have the advanced wildfire detecting camera systems that are throughout the county. They've just actually added an AI feature to those. So now um, the cameras will actually notify us when it sees smoke on the horizon. There's been major improvements to the alert and warning systems in the county. Um, really, it's based on a change of philosophy. Uh, the city now has access um, and is able to use all of the alerting tools available. Um, we obviously do early and very fruitful uh, evacuations to get people out of the way so we can go in and engage the fire. And we have pre-designated evacuation zones throughout the entire county, including the city. We've worked very hard to increase our cooperation and collaboration with all of our partners, particularly at the federal, state, and local government le level, but we're also including nonprofit organizations and educational institutions. The operational enhancements we've made have been, been very, very uh, significant, um, including we do a lot more upstaffing where we add additional equipment or people on when we see uh, weather situations coming into the county. Um, and that goes not only for the city, but throughout the county. So we have additional firefighters and fire engines on the street. Um, we'll use state funding for pre-positioning of resources to bring outside resources in to bolster our firefighting force. And we have a new county all call system where we can call every firefighter back to duty throughout the entire county. We use that first in the Kincaid fire. We actually used it twice in the Kincaid fire and then again in the glass fire. So that brings everybody back to, to, uh, to duty with one push of the button from our dispatch center. One of the things you'll be hearing a lot about uh, today and throughout the course of, of this fire season is the development and implement, implementation of a vegetation management program that's based off our community wildfire protection plan. That's a bulk of what the Fire Prevention Bureau has been working on and that has been funded and is in play now. And then development and implementation of what we call the Wildland Resiliency and Response Strategic Plan. Essentially, that was a look at the organization on how we can improve our response to wildland fires without adding stations or people. So with that, we're, we're in the process of purchasing two, two additional wildland firefighting engines with two more on the way after that. Um, different equipment, we're looking at our staffing models, our operational components. So it's really retooling the entire organization to face this new normal that we're, we're experiencing here in Sonoma County. And last but certainly not least is the enhancement to community engagement before, during, and after a weather event or a major incident. Um, quite frankly, this is part of that, and I don't think uh, seven years, or sorry, four years ago, we would have seen the turnout for this type of event as we are today. So again, we're not in this alone, and we're not done. Regardless of how the fire department and the city have improved to face this new normal, the community deserves a bulk of the credit. We have witnessed a major shift in preparation, engagement, awareness, and reactivity by the community, and if it wasn't all for you, we couldn't do our job. Before we move to the next speaker, I'd just like to remind everybody that Spanish uh, translation is available and ASL interp interpretation is available as well. So with that, I will turn it over to Assistant Fire Marshal Paul Lowenthal to introduce us to our next topic. Thank you. Paul, if you're talking, I think you're muted. I apologize. You'd think after a year of doing this, I'd, I'd get that, hit it twice. Let's try that again. My name is Paul Lonthal, Assistant Fire Marshal with the Santa Rosa Fire Department, uh, and I'm joined by Fire Marshal Scott Moon. Uh, the two of us uh, today will bring forth a number of topics. Uh, for those of you that are following the entire series of Wildfire Ready, uh, there's obviously a lot of information to cover uh, our goal is to uh, not only share some of that information here, but also ensure that our community as a whole is aware of the resources uh, that have been developed over not only uh, what we've learned over the last couple of years, uh, but through ultimately our goals uh, that are better to prepare our community uh, for what unfortunately seems to be the new normal uh, around Sonoma County and the greater Bay Area. Uh, wildfire ready for us uh, is an exciting opportunity uh, it is uh, our ability to engage again with our community and share resources and, and make our community as a whole uh, better prepared. 
So one of the first questions we get uh, pretty regularly uh, still is what is the WUI or the Wildland Urban Interface and where is it? Uh, these days, the WUI is actually getting confused with, unfortunately, because of the current conditions, which highlights the importance of this series, the drought or water use efficiency. So there's a lot of community meetings that have been taking place that are using that term uh, interchangeably. However, uh, for purposes of this, again, when we are talking about the WUI, although water use efficiency and the drought are concerns of ours, uh, it is referring to the wildland urban interface fire area, what we refer to as locally. And that's an area that is uh, a significant risk to wildfires uh, here locally within the city of Santa Rosa. Uh, and our area also includes some of the state's by, uh, very high fire hazard severity zones. So even though the state has some of those zones within the city limits, we, the city of Santa Rosa, have defined our local area as required to by state law for the areas that we have classified as the WUI, uh, where any applicable codes uh, for new development, construction, ordinances, all are specific uh, to that geographical area. So the area was originally uh, developed in 2007. And the area, although uh, has been infilled and additional residents have built, with, built within it, uh, the boundaries of it have not changed. Uh, historically, uh, we had directed residents uh, back to a PDF that had a general area uh, of the map uh, showing where the areas were. Uh, and as you can see, they're kind of broken up into four primary areas in Santa Rosa. Uh, one being in the northeast, sorry, northwest uh, part of the city, the Fountain Grove uh, into Hidden Valley, Montecito Heights area. Uh, to the northeast, the Skyhawk and uh, kind of North Calistoga Road area. To the southeast, uh, stretching from Melita Road all the way down to Bennett Valley Heights on the Annadale State Park side of Summerfield Road. And to our far east, uh, coming in again off of uh, Melita uh, in Los Alamos Road area uh, into the south and southwest side of Oakmont. Based on uh, feedback and really our intention to provide as much information and make it as easily accessible to our community as possible, part of the development of our overall wildfire ready strategy uh, was a new website, srcity.org forward slash wildfire ready is the hub of a lot of the information you'll hear throughout the week. And again, where we're pushing residents to to get the information. On that website is now a link, Wildland Urban Interface, that will now take you to a website where residents can now type in their address and see whether or not they're within or outside of the Wildland Urban Interface. We also uh, have some areas within our WUI that are not within the city limits where we have county islands. Uh, the website will let you know now whether you're in or outside of the city limits uh, and help guide you uh, to your respective uh, fire agency. For us locally, for those county pockets within our WUI, you'll uh, uh, be under the jurisdiction of Sonoma County Fire District or Permit Sonoma, uh, the building representatives for the County of Sonoma. So jumping right into it, uh, what we wanna do uh, as an organization, again, is, is ultimately protect your home, protect your structure. So up next will be Scott Moon, who will take you through uh, some of the important elements uh, that include defensible space uh, to home hardening. Hey, good afternoon. Thank you, Paul. As we begin to look at protecting your home, <clears throat> pardon me, we focus on three key areas. The first being that of defensible space. And what we wanna look at here is to kind of try and simplify this. We hear defensible space as a buzzword shared quite often in this arena. This is actually going to be a buffer zone that you implement around your home between that space and the wildland area. What we wanna try and do is take that oppor opportunity to prevent any type of direct flame contact or that possibility for radiant heat. And what we would look at doing is focusing in on three key areas of the home ignition zones. 
And when we begin, you can move to the next slide, Paul. This map will give you a representation of those three key areas. And we look at zone one within that structural framework as our stepping out our back door, if you will. And we want to look from that zero to 30 foot area. We want to take the opportunity to move around your property. And that zero to 30 may not be as expansive as this picture dictates. It may be the perspective of to your property line, but you want to take full advantage of the opportunities to limb any trees that may be overhanging your home to back 10 foot from your structure. So you create separation. You also want to utilize as much hardscape as you can around your structure. Paul will touch on that a little bit more in a few moments, but look to incorporate non-combustible types of materials that can be utilized within your footprint and try and take out any items that are unnecessarily placed within that zero to 30 foot zone. That really is gonna be your strongest defense. The next area is that zone two, or we wanna look at the 30 to 100 foot separation. Uh, the picture that you're seeing now just illustrates for you some of those examples where homes have taken that step to provide the separation within their boundaries and how it can look in a landscape format where you have multiple homes that adjoin one another. We can see how the fire will burn in certain areas and that can be due to the fuel treatments within those areas and the separations. But when we're in that zone two, what we wanna focus on is the fact that now we're looking at more of that 30 to 100 foot area. So we're stepping back and we're trying to provide a much broader focus and we wanna create separation of the fuel types. And if you can look at it from the perspective of fuel islands, if you will. So instead of having groupings of large plant material, try and break them up into smaller islands so that way, if there is fire burning through the area, what you can see is the ability for separation of fuel types. So you prevent that rapid growth and you actually would have slower development within those areas. The other thing we talk about, another key word is ladder fuel. And what ladder fuel means is you have your ground covering material or the base of that ladder, and then you'll have trees or brush. And by taking the opportunity to limb up the trees and brush to create that separation. In essence, what you do is you eliminate that ladder fuel. So the ground covering is going to ignite. And as it does, you're gonna get flame heights based on the type of material that you may have in those areas. Those flame heights can easily get into brush and trees if not properly trimmed. So hence removing that ladder fuel or the ability for the fuels to migrate from one low surface area material to a higher area. Uh, the other thing we wanna talk about is separation of trees and the tree tops. So as we look at tree spacing on the property, trying to remove unnecessary trees that are bunched or grouped together. Again, we're looking at slowing down any approaching fire to the area that moves into your property and has ample fuel we want to reduce that fuel loading and provide more separation. And for the properties that do have that area, zone three is 100 to 200 foot from your structure. So obviously that gets much more broad. And again, we're looking to thin out material. We're looking to remove dead trees that may be on the ground. Snags is another term you'll hear those referred to but we're wanting to remove that litter and debris from the ground cover areas. So that way it minimizes that travel of fuel into that location. And it gives you the opportunity to have more resistance to ignition of your property due to a passing or impending wildfire into your area. And with that, we can move to the next slide. And as mentioned, this was an example of homes within the glass fire footprint where we observed some different fire burn patterns and how different areas were impacted based on the fuel loading and the fuel types within that area. 
And Paul, if there's anything additional you wanted to share on that. Thank you, Scott. Yeah, the uh, as you can see, and Scott said uh, said it pretty clearly, is that we did see a lot of good examples of what defensible space can do uh, within our community. Uh, it's very clear that uh, a lot of the homeowners have been heeding the warnings, uh, and the information uh, that we've been sharing has been well received, and really did uh, lead to a lot of good uh, saves throughout the glass fire, uh, where our firefighters were able to actively engage uh, in the neighborhoods, uh, fight fire, and use a lot of the defensible space uh, and uh, techniques that we had uh, asked and have been educating on, uh, and it truly did pay off. There were some areas uh, where it didn't uh, work out as well, and that's part of why we're continuing to do this and we're continuing to share information, and that hopes hopefully uh, more people uh, will uh, provide for better defensible space and different measures to reduce the risks associated with fires here locally. And then keying in off of uh, what Scott talked about, we're really focusing a lot of our education and outreach on that zero to five foot zone. Uh, that has proven uh, to be uh, an area that has led to a lot of destruction locally, but also an area that's led to a lot of successful saves. Uh, we are really uh, pushing residents to, to remove a lot of the combustible vegetation, uh, mulches, different materials from around their homes that are more susceptible to ember cast. We watched uh, both the glass, the tubs, the nuns, uh, and the threats associated with the Kincaid and what the ember cast was doing to structure, uh, structures within the, uh, the, the front of the fire. We know that the weak spot and one of the weak areas is where those embers are, are catching uh, and leading to structures uh, that are igniting and then further uh, pushing and spreading the fire. So our hope is that not only will people limb their trees up, remove vegetation uh, from out and around their properties, but really look at their own homes. Uh, for us, uh, again, we're really uh, hoping to discourage a lot of the barks, uh, specifically here in the picture you see is uh, gorilla hair mulch. Uh, no matter how many conversations and uh, community meetings we've had about it, uh, we still see its use uh, within our wildland interface. And as you can see here, it's extremely problematic. Not only does it burn very easily, but it also ties up a lot of resources. This home uh, is probably standing today because firefighters worked hard and feverishly to put out a lot of the gorilla hair that had caught fire and was spreading in the winds around the property. So we are uh, looking at potential uh, ordinances that will regulate uh, the types of materials that can be used within our wildland interface. However, the first step we've taken is for all new construction built within our wildland interface, we will now require zero to five feet of non-combustible space uh, uh, zone for new structures that are unsprinklered and three feet for sprinklered structures. So that is something new that we're doing here. And that will be the first of many uh, ordinances uh, that we'll be working on through our new vegetation management program. Uh, the other thing that we're hearing a lot of is costs associated with this zones. A majority of our homes within our WUI are existing structures that have existing vegetation, plants, materials. Anything you do in those areas uh, is gonna be a step in the right direction whether it's limbing your bushes up, removing the leaf litter, uh, thinning the materials out, anything versus nothing is gonna be a step in the right direction. But now is the time, especially in light of the drought, uh, where there's different measures that can be taken to not only protect your structure, but also reduce your use of water. So we are encouraging people to 
to continue to remove vegetation from immediately around their structure, again, to reduce the threat of fire, reduce the fuels that could be ignited from ember cast, and ultimately help save water. All right, with this next slide, we wanted to touch on that third key element back to protecting your home, and that stems to home hardening. And when you think of home hardening, the majority of the homes within our wildland urban interface area are pre-existing of more restrictive building code requirements that integrate home hardening into the construction method. So when we we think about this, it seems very overwhelming of where do I start and what can I do? And when we look back on some of our experiences while being out in the field during these epic fires, we have seen such simple things that can be done that are low cost, but very high impact. And that starts with vents of your home. That previous picture that Paul had shown, you could see the vents just off of the ground level. And by ensuring that you have proper protective screens in place, there's a number of different products that are on the market available for retrofit of existing homes. We'll actually incorporate some studies from UC analysts that have put together various information to help us understand the different products that are available out there. Uh, a number of them are, as I mentioned, easy to retrofit into existing homes and can achieve a better ability of your home to resist the intrusion of an ember-driven fire. So those are good starting points to look at all the eaves throughout your home and try and begin to incorporate a new screening protective measure in those locations. The other item, very simple, is gutter guards. And what we have found is when people do not take that opportunity in the summer months to clear gutters of accumulated debris and material that fell over the previous winter, what we find is those become easy targets for wind-driven embers to land and ignite within those locations as well as they are going to give you the ability to ignite portions of the home that may be in direct contact with that type of information. So what you can do is take the time during the summer months to clean your gutters. And once they are clean, go ahead and install relatively inexpensive gutter guards that will help through the fall time of year when we see the most accumulation of litter and debris and prevent that from accumulating within your gutters. So the gutters can actually work as designed to remove the water that runs off from your roof but not accumulate that litter and debris that can then become combustible materials leading to potential ignition of your home. Another relatively inexpensive item is to weatherproof your home. So with the use of weather stripping materials, you can walk around your home and self inspect and check for gaps within any man doors, windows, your garage door. Those are all locations when exposed to a wind driven fire embers have the opportunity to migrate to the interior of your home, very similar to that of the vent locations that we spoke about. So when you take that time to go through and provide that weather stripping or the weather element to remove that ability of wind driven fires to push the embers into your home, then you increase your survivability during that wind driven fire. The next slide, Paul. The other areas that we did not touch on, we could look at decks and trying to incorporate, again, this is at a more large scale and we understand there's larger costs associated, but look at replacing combustible decks with non-combustible materials. Look at your siding and see if there's opportunities for you to incorporate non-combustible siding materials. A big one is your roof. So the roof is probably the most susceptible point on your home, given the surface area and the probability of having material and debris that blows on it during a wind driven fire. So looking at opportunities to replace your roofing material with a newer non combustible type of 
material. And then windows is another key area. Windows actually play in with um, your skylights if you have them incorporated into your home as well. Trying to replace them with double paned and also if you can get tempered glass as it does not shatter and it would provide more susceptibility of integrity and not allowing the flame to penetrate through the window and into the interior of the home. So those are ways where we can find those next steps and trying to realize this is a very large cost in an effort to make these changes, but trying to take small steps in that effort and trying to identify areas in which every step you take, like Paul mentioned, where you can improve your survivability is what the key is. So as we began, we wanna look at our defensible space and we wanna work from our home out. And if we're in an area where, where known fires are moving to our home in advance of evacuation, take the time to move combustibles inside, move combustibles away from the exterior of your home. Take that advantage of the opportunity you have to make your home less susceptible to ignition. Move plants away from the home, move plants away from windows or openings where they could ignite and then easily travel into the home. These are all small steps that you can take in your effort to, again, try and make your home as least susceptible to ignition during any type of wildfire that may impact your property. And with that, I'll turn it back over to Paul. Thank you, Scott. So the next thing we wanna talk about is our weed abatement program. So not just focusing on what our homeowners can do, but what we're doing or requiring to be done uh, to make our community safer. So from the weed abatement standpoint, uh, there's sort of two elements associated with it. One is the management of vegetation uh, or fuels, grasses uh, throughout our community on city owned properties and in coordination on a lot of open spaces and HOA properties. So we regularly on an annual basis uh, coordinate with the county uh, for areas of open space and property they have within the city limits. The state, both fish and wildlife who have a number of open spaces uh, in our community, as well as uh, Caltrans with their right-of-ways, uh, both undeveloped and developed, uh, as well as uh, city-owned properties. In addition to that work uh, that is initiated early in the season and prioritized at the highest risk and working its way down, as you can imagine from a city, county and state level, there's a lot of properties throughout the city. And the goal is to work through them as quickly as efficiently as possible with the resources available. Understanding, uh, unfortunately, that as much as we wish we could snap our fingers and have everything done at once, it's not the world we live in and we're forced with uh, making the decisions based on risk and typically working in our wild interface and high risk areas first and away from them. Uh, we encourage uh, residents if they see areas uh, of concern uh, to, in some cases you'll, you'll see the historically, uh, the timeframes uh, that those properties are completed uh, and to uh, allow us the opportunity to work through them uh, at a local and county level as we continue to work with our community to bring their properties into compliance. Uh, it is our intention to educate uh, and explain and help guide uh, versus uh, moving straight to enforcement. However, we do have an enforcement plan for those that do not comply. So annually, uh, we conduct and initiate our weed abatement inspections once fire season is declared. Historically, the declaration uh, has been based off of CAL FIRE season. However, CAL FIRE, uh, as of last year, no longer declares or stops fire season. Uh, for them, it's always a fire season around the state. So they change their staffing levels based on the needs, which, may, which uh, necessitated us to uh, utilize a new process to declare fire season locally. And that's what you saw done here for the first time. Uh, with the declaration of our season starting on the 17th of this month. Once the season is declared, all properties within 
our wildland urban interface. So all properties within the wildland interface are required to comply with the ordinance, as well as all undeveloped vacant lots in the city. And then any other property that happens to have more than a half an acre of undeveloped land. Uh, really our focus is on the WUI and all vacant lots around the city. When all is said and done, the fire department will have inspected upwards of 13,000 properties for compliance with the ordinance. A notice is sent out uh, once inspections are initiated to property owners, letting them know of the requirements and that a reinspection will take place. Uh, it will typically take us almost upwards in some cases, uh, several weeks to a month to get through the first round of inspections throughout the entire city. Uh, that allows property owners in most cases to abate their properties and bring it into compliance by the time a second inspection is done. If after the second inspection is done and we go through our notice of violations and uh, properties remain out of compliance, we have a process to then abate the property and then recover our costs associated with the abatement and the inspection. Historically, uh, we do see uh, significant compliance, uh, primarily after the first inspection is done. Uh, our outreach uh, ahead of the season typically alleviates a lot of the need for uh, notices. However, there still are a lot of properties uh, that will historically take action after they receive the notice. One of the areas uh, that we struggled with compliance, believe it or not, and uh, uh, is actually a lot of our burn scars. Uh, we experienced a number of residents who went through a significant uh, loss in 2017. However, their properties had historically been well maintained and landscaped. Uh, after the fires uh, during rebuilds and or uh, while the properties were waiting to rebuild, uh, those vacant properties uh, had regrowth of seasonal grasses and were noticed for uh, non-compliance with the ordinance. The goal was always to make our community safer. Uh, we heard a lot of negative feedback about the notices uh, to our survivors. However, our goal was to make it safe for the community and ultimately to make it safe for a lot of the rebuilds taking place within our WUI so that the weeds uh, were as controlled as we can possibly make them. So what else are we doing uh, in, within our community to make us safer? Uh, our community wildfire protection plan is truly the backbone of everything we're doing here today and will continue to do. The community wildfire protection plan uh, was a plan that was approved by council in September of last year and it serves as the five year uh, plan for us that will be renewed in five years, but it's the, the outline for what we can do uh, with a roadmap to mitigate our risks and losses associated with the threat of wildfires locally. So the Community Wildfire Protection Plan truly was a collaborative community effort. Uh, not only did it involve the consultants uh, that were hired through a grant, uh, but it also involved a significant amount of public outreach, feedback, comments, uh, meetings with steering, our steering committee uh, stakeholders throughout the city and county uh, at a local and state level, as well as upwards of 600 additional uh, surveys that were filled uh, out by community members. With that, uh, the plan identified where our threats were to our community. As you can see on the map is a, a risk assessment map, uh, as well as uh, uh, kind of the, the hazards associated with the fuels within our community. Um, so to understand what actions we needed to take and where our threats and risks were and how we should mitigate them. So there was science involved in this process, public feedback involved in the process. Um, and really it outlined uh, what we feel will be a successful uh, roadmap for us to ultimately make our community safer. With it came nine objectives with 46 actionable items. Uh, they co covered everything from improvement, improvement, sorry, the improvement of our tracking and coordination systems, uh, which is a GIS or a mapping component. 
uh, that is already underway. Our goal with that is to track and map where vegetation management and fuel reductions are taking place throughout our community. We're working to approve our evacuation routes. Uh, we have applied for a $2.8 million grant for several evacuation routes throughout our city. That money will be used to offset the costs and pay for the removal of fuels along those routes, primarily on private property. Uh, we're working to educate our public on how to mitigate uh, the risks associated with the damage from wildfires. The website, srcity.org forward slash wildfire ready is the first big step we are taking to improve not only our education, but improve our preparedness, uh, which is the next objective. Um, a lot of work has gone in and will continue to go into that website to centralize the information for our residents uh, and where they can go to get current good information for what they can do within their home, within their property, uh, and around their neighborhoods. We recognize the need to increase structural hardening, meaning we have a lot of existing non-conforming homes within our community that were built decades ago uh, that are still tucked within our wildland. We have applied for another several million dollars worth of grants designed to help offset the costs of defensible space and home hardening elements. These are two grants that are currently with FEMA. Uh, it's important to note that the city has been applying for several million dollars worth of grants since 2017 and have been unsuccessful with the exception of the grant that we received for the Community Wildfire Protection Plan. Our hope with uh, the plan and a lot of the work that we're doing uh, at a local, state, and federal level uh, will help uh, get those grants approved so that we can start helping our community be better prepared. We will be working to treat uh, vegetation to reduce the wildfire risks. Uh, we have another grant uh, that was submitted to Cal Fire uh, for treatment and removal of dead vegetation and dead trees on the north side of Fountain Grove into the Reebly Mark West corridor that will help mitigate the risks of future wildfires from our community. That money will hopefully help offset the costs of private property owners, which again will make our community safer. One thing we've learned both through the development of the plan and through history is that our community is at risk from wildfires that enter the city from the north. So you're going to see a lot of uh, effort put into hardening our community on the north side to prevent that repeat incident. We're going to improve our inspection and enforcement program. Uh, we will be rolling out not only ordinances, uh, but ultimately education and educate and inspection programs. So our goal is to educate our community on the needs, inspect them, and ultimately move our community into an enforcement uh, of these uh, future rules and regulations to make our community as a whole safer. Um, the website Wildfire Ready, as I mentioned, uh, really is gonna be the hub for our community. Uh, we will continue to improve upon this website. We'll continue to provide information based on feedback we receive, based on the lessons we continue to learn, um, updates on grants. A lot of this information uh, will all be found here. Um, we look forward to uh, not only the remainder of this week and a lot of the elements that we'll be covering, um, but the future of our ability to engage with our community in the years to come. Uh, with that, um, obviously, there's a lot of information uh, that we have to cover. Um, we touched on a number of topics, um, but really want to uh, guide our community to this website um, and allow you uh, the opportunity to uh, be educated, uh, learn more. And uh, with that, I will uh, toss it back to Magali and we'll start our question and answers. Uh, thank you so much for all of that really great information. Uh, we're going to just get in here. There are a lot of good questions. Um, so a question to any of our panelists um, we have from a community member. Um, I'm unclear why the homes that abut Taylor Mountain Park, including the Regal Ranch subdivision, are not in the wildland urban interface.
So there's a number of elements uh, that go into defining uh, what uh, is the WUI, what is required for the WUI. Um, that area uh, based on fuel uh, topography is not. Um, we will continue to evaluate any changes in them, uh, but there's a lot that comes with uh, being incorporated in the WUI. Uh, we did get not only questions from that area, but also within uh, Coffee Park uh, for why that area isn't included or uh, hasn't been included. Um, again, it's there's certain conditions and findings that have to be found uh, and reported to the state that then need to be uh, adopted at a local level. It's not as simple as just maintaining and, and calling it a WUI. A lot comes with it. It comes compliance with code and unfortunately, as we're also seeing, it comes with a lot of uh, concerns and issues with insurance. So we want to make sure that areas of our city uh, that are in the WUI should be in the WUI, need to be in the WUI, and we uh, do not intend to just uh, move the line across the city uh, without having a good solid basis for it. Thank you. Um, so the next question we have here is a uh, community member stated, we spent much time walking the fire burned areas during the lockdown. Our strongest impression was of burned houses near unburned ones. Has anyone done a study of why some houses burn and others don't? For example, at Mountain Hawk, the fire jumped over almost all houses closest to the hill and burned 12 houses farther from the hill. Yeah, so a lot was learned and a lot uh was looked at in Mountain Hawk specifically. As you saw from some of the pictures early on, defensible space and home hardening definitely paid off in some cases and made it very easy for firefighters uh, to engage and protect the structures. In other cases, regardless of uh, a lot of the education and outreach and information, there's some residents that have just chosen to not take action and or they just don't have the financial means to take action. We are aware of that and that is part of why we are applying for grants to help offset some of those costs. But in some of the cases where we saw the significant structural damage, it was based on the type of fuels, uh, brush, trees, and ladder fuels that were in their yards uh, on those downhill slope sides uh, of their structures that were open uh, and almost uh, helped fuel and, and aid the, uh, the direction of the fire. And in other areas, uh, it was based on uh, combustible vegetation and ships and materials uh, immediately against fences and up against structures. So those lessons learned and what we saw are what is being discussed and worked on behind the scenes to help uh, develop future, future ordinances uh, to get people uh, to take action in some cases to mitigate that risk and again, protect our community. Thank you. And sort of similar to that previous question, uh, will the city of Santa Rosa require non-combustible fences adjacent to structures in a wooly area? Yes, that has been added to the most recent code adoption that is for new structures. So that's something to be mindful of. New homes that are built within the wildland urban interface are subject to more restrictive building requirements. As Paul mentioned, there are a number of recommendations we make for the existing or we refer to as built environment and taking the opportunity to replace combustible materials that abut your home and utilize non-combustible materials or finishings is our high recommendation at this point. And we and will continue to evaluate as we move forward. And I will add one thing we have heard is uh, the need to or request to not allow wooden fences within our wildlife interface at, at all. Uh, we do not have a plan uh, or intend to do that at, that at this point. Where we did see fences destroyed by fire were areas where they had uh, heavy amounts of leaf litter and other combustible landscape materials up against fences. However, we did see entire neighborhoods uh, that had significant amounts of uh, destruction and the fences were 100% intact because there was no receptive fuel bed, meaning the embers had nothing to ignite. So uh, we are encouraging residents to clear leaf litter uh, and clear, in some cases, some of that more uh, heavily susceptible uh, mulch material away from wooden fences. 
uh, to keep them uh, from igniting. And we do on that website, the Wildfire Ready website under resources, uh, have a, a study on different types of chips and mulches. Thank you. Um, another good question here. Um, is there a fire danger inspection service that can come to our house and tell us what we need to do? And then separate, separately and similarly, would you be able to recommend where to get vented screens or vent screens? Yes, yeah, so two pieces to that. Uh, we, through uh, the vegetation management program funds, have just brought on an additional fire inspector and we'll be hiring a second uh, additional fire inspector. Both of them will be assigned to our vegetation management program and will be available uh, to conduct uh, inspections uh, and assessments uh, within our community. So we will uh, have information on that uh, that will get posted on our website. Uh, I will commit to getting that information uh, up on our website by the end of the week. Uh, under resources. So uh, we will have that and the ability to uh, contact some of the staff uh, to help with those assessments. Um, again, that is our goal to get out there uh, uh, and engage with our community and help uh, provide that information. As far as uh, the brands of the vents, uh, I believe uh, Chief Moon had discussed that. Uh, we will put up a study again under that resources tab. We did get some of those additional questions uh, and we'll make sure that the information related to uh, the vents is also included uh, with different types of brands uh, and that UC study that was done uh, will be on our resources tab as well. And just a quick follow up, Magalia, you can go to home improvement stores such as Home Depot, Lowe's, they carry a number of different products within their inventory. And there will also be in the materials that Paul is going to provide on the website, references to different manufacturers as well of compliant installation products that can be utilized for that purpose. Thank you. Um, and then here's a question of, uh, we have many gallons uh, in gas cans for our emergency generator. Where should we place these cans if we know the house is going to be overrun from the fire? Or if, I'm assuming if there's already a situation. Yeah, so that's going to depend on a case by case basis, uh, you know, whether you have uh, a flammable liquid storage locker, which believe it or not, a lot of residents do, where it's a cabinet specifically designed to put flammable liquids in. Uh, other residents will choose uh, to put them out uh, at least 30 to 50 feet away from the home in a clear open space um, that's clear to vegetation. Uh, and other residents uh, will put it out in the driveway uh, away from the structure. So uh, making it, uh, you know, getting it out away from the, the, um, the side of your home or area where it could fuel the fire is, is our priority. Uh, but again, a lot of times it just depends on the quantities, uh, what resources you have uh, and the setup of your property. Um, another question about um, the crawl space under your house. Should the vents, should the vents be sealed? You don't want to seal them. Uh, and that's actually something to be aware of too. And why oftentimes we'll, uh, um, uh, ask that you consult sometimes a professional, uh, depending on any existing issues you have with ventilation, uh, whether it's uh, moisture in your subfloor or attic, um, it's just something to be aware of. Um, but the venting that we wanna see done is yes, uh, at the ground level as well, well as the attic level. Think of your vents uh, as kind of the ability, think of embers like rice. If you can easily take rice and throw it through your vents, the embers can get in there. So it really highlights the importance of uh, replacing those quarter inch uh, typical older screens with something finer uh, that can be uh, either overlaid on top or underneath or completely replaced by one of the retrofit vents. Okay, our next question is, uh, 
we, we see that many people's houses are nearly are on inaccessible roads that the fire department may not be able to get um, up to. Uh, will these folks have some sort of notice to that effect? And um, would, would, is there a way for them to find that information out that they, they're on an inaccessible road uh, before we have a fire? So if the question is about their specific driveway, uh, part of our inspections, uh, when we start doing defensible space and home hardening, uh, sorry, defensible space inspections uh, will be access. So we do require uh, 13 foot, six inches of access on fire department roads. So fire access roads that are required for fire department access, uh, that is something that we will enforce on, uh, on roadways uh, actively. Um, if the, the question is about uh, our ability to just educate, uh, a lot of those resources and information is uh, on our website uh, under the Ready, Set, Go program. Um, but again, it's, it's, it depends on, on the circumstances. But yes, we do want property owners to clear their driveways to make it accessible for us so that we can get in and protect structures uh, in the event of a wildfire. Uh, thank you. And there's another question here that um, on the city's wildfire ready website, uh, will there be a place for community comment suggestions and uh, will there be folks monitoring those comments and feedback? No, we're encouraging residents uh, to currently use the email srfd at srcity.org. Uh, that email uh, is monitored by fire department uh, administration, and those emails are quickly uh, moved over to uh, typically myself, uh, who will then identify, uh, based on it being related to vegetation management program, uh, what either needs to be done to address it or how to respond to the question. But our, our goal is to centralize that by email right now. Um, thank you. And are pet doors a fire hazard? So again, that's going to depend uh, what kind of door it is. Is it free swinging? Uh, you know, any, any opening has the potential, especially if it can easily blow open uh, in the wind, then yes, uh, there's the potential that it can blow open uh, and allow embers to get in. So uh, consider the direction that the door opens, uh, whether it opens uh, out, whether it opens, well, sorry, that was a, never mind. Doors swing both ways. <laughs> um, yes, there's the potential that it, it can be a weak spot. Uh, so consider putting it in an area that may be more protected from the wind. Thank you. Um, what can we do as renters to get the owners to do some fire preparedness? Uh, even as a renter, uh, you're welcome to make the request for us to come do an assessment. Uh, and we're happy to provide the recommendations and they can be passed along to the homeowner. Uh, thank you. And I think we'll end with this question since we're running out of time. Is the city looking at the age of occupants within the WUI neighborhoods to help identify, or identify higher risk areas? So we do regularly work uh, with our um, uh, various community members. Uh, if the question, it looks like the question is specific to age. Um, I wouldn't say that's uh, necessarily a factor to make it uh, a higher risk area. It highlights the importance of community engagement events like this, uh, not only uh, through this program, but a lot of the work that we do with various HOAs and uh, higher, higher risk community members. Uh, we regularly engage with uh, our nonprofits, uh, as well as uh, different organizations uh, for our more vulnerable populations. Uh, if you look at uh, Oakmont, for example, uh, we do a lot of work uh, with the Oakmont Village Association as well as the various HOAs, as well as some of our other senior communities uh, throughout Santa Rosa. So 
fire uh, obviously doesn't recognize boundaries, doesn't recognize age. Uh, our goal is purely to just uh, do what we can to make sure everybody has the resources and the information uh, regardless of age. Thank you so much, um, all of our panelists, presenters. We are unfortunately out of time. However, I do invite everyone to join us tomorrow and Thursday. We will continue um, providing information. Um, you can find our, our next event on our website. At 12 p.m., we will have an English um, version of the program and at 6 p.m., a Spanish version of the program where we will have a fantastic nonprofits that are partnering with us to talk about our shared trauma around wildfires. Thank you so much and please uh, visit our website and the email provided as well. Thank you all, have a great day.